All right, we're live. Welcome, guys. Welcome to the journey within. This is a journey of deconstruction and reconstruction of the death and rebirth. And today I am going back to to my deconstruction roots. And I'm very glad and honored to be interviewing Ryan Cook, who is a spiritually conscious business coach, just a brilliant mind and such a tender heart. So Ryan, thank you so much for coming on, man. I think this would be a good conversation. Yeah, brother. I appreciate you um, having me. And uh, I know the first time I ever met you, well, that was one of the one of the first things that we had kind of realized we had in common was a similar spiritual past. And yes. so uh, and ended up in the same space together now. So I thought it was really, uh, really cool. And I was excited to finally get to talk to you and hear a little bit about your journey, too. Yeah, I, I'm I'm very curious about your story and like where, you know, how it got started and, and just the, the whole thing. And I'm <clears throat> I'm just curious because, you know, I just like you don't meet too many people who've who've gone through that, at least where in the circles that I've been in. You know, I'm, I'm here in Dallas and it's the belt buckle of the Bible belt. There's yeah. three churches in every corner. And so you don't meet too many people who've actually really truly deconstructed from a place of very solid faith. Like that was their life, you know? Mm, yeah. Yeah. You started off with like the mention of like this death and rebirth experience. And that's what this was for me. It was death. It was, you know, when I got into church, it was a death of the old way that I was before I got became saved. And as I started deconstructing my faith, so to speak, although from my perspective, it felt like constructing it for the first time. It was, you know, it was the first time where I'd like taken a step out and no longer, there wasn't a voice or a scripture, or anything that could override my internal guidance system. So I was willing, I got to a place where I was willing to become a blasphemer for my truth. And so that was, you know, it, but this is literally the first like actual time I've spoke specifically about this, like publicly, to be honest, like I've talked about it lots with friends and lots of with people in my circle, but, um, you know, it's for like, it's been about three and a half, four years since I would say like, I had like my first like major spiritual awakening but i was already like deconstructing my faith and like moving moving away from the super fundamentalist paradigm that i had on the world and you know i've often say like i felt like i was following the love of christ out of the church like wow. i found i found the love of christ and then at a certain point that didn't cohese with me, with the idea of a father that didn't love me at any level, you know? And so that started my like pulling of the thread of like, what is true love? And, and that took me on a, a death and rebirth journey for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the scriptures have a lot, right. Um, but I, I kind of interpret it differently now and, and through a much more psychological lens. And uh, so I'd be, I'd be curious, did you, grow up in the church yeah so i grew up um with just a lot of trauma in my childhood i had um you know my mother for instance was 17 when she had me um mm -hmm. so she was a very young teen mom she was also um a very abused child honestly more abused than anybody i've really ever heard of outside of my mom and by her biological father and that had like that even had a lot of like uh ritualistic and like religious tones to it and um but and so and then i also didn't know my father so my wow. my father my biological father cheated on his wife with my mom at the time got her pregnant didn't really want anything to do with her or me so i never i never knew my father growing up and then my mother was um, about when I was like two years old, she started having flashbacks or like she started reprocessing trauma that she had completely 
relegated to her shadow for basically, you know, a long time. She had stuffed it out of her conscious. And whenever I was like two, it was about the same age that she started being abused. And so as she had a child that was two years old, it started bringing up all of this trauma that she, that was completely out of her awareness basically. And so my childhood was one of being raised by a woman who was trying to heal herself from deep, deep trauma. And so I had the definition of a broken home. Yeah. And so my about eighth grade, um, I was living in Chicago with my mom for a while. We moved like all over the place. So me and my wife were actually um, talking about it last night and I, I can't, I couldn't even count them if I wanted to, but I've probably at least lived in a different home or different place for every age I am old. So I've probably lived in at least wow. 30 different places, you know? So for me, the normal was always not having like stable ground. And so I left Chicago. It was like, um, we lived there for about a year and a half. I moved up there with my mom and she basically worked three jobs, single mom, trying to keep a, a place for us in Chicago. I was in like seventh grade. And so I moved to this new city and I didn't have anybody there or know anybody. And I spent like 23 hours a day without parental supervision. So just doing traveling around Chicago, taking care of myself throughout the week, like just a very, I had to grow up really fast. And so I came back from that, stayed with my grandparents for Christmas. And um, I just told them I didn't want to go back. I was like, you know, I, yeah, I can't go back there. It was just, it was just too hard. And so um, I stayed and my grandparents were, my grandma at the time was in a Pentecostal Church of Holiness church. And so mm. if you know anything about particular denominations, the Pentecostal Church of Holiness is Protestant, very fundamentalist, you know, down to, you know, way more. So like I eventually like went liberal into the assemblies of God. But... Oh my gosh. The assemblies <laughs> of God was liberal. Right, oh, right, right. So oh, I went to I, I went to, I went to the liberal side of Protestants and, <laughs> and to the AG from the very, very like, but um so I started going to this church with my grandma. Didn't, you know, I didn't want to go, but it was kind of this thing, like if you're in our home, we go to church, you know, like this home, we go to church, like and so eventually my mom, she moved back. There was like just so much craziness and when it couldn't even get into it even with the story of her moving back but all of that to say this I ended up getting forced to get go to church camp one summer like the summer of my eighth grade year um, I was very like I did cocaine for the first time when I was in sixth grade I really? smoked wow. smoked marijuana for the first time in fifth grade like um, you know was suspended from and suspended out of a school system by like third grade like just lots of trouble in school because my home life was so destabilized that I didn't know anything else, you know? And it was like, we didn't, we were low income, we were poor, like didn't have money to participate in all the things at school that other kids did sometimes. And so, man, I got into a lot of trouble at school too. Interestingly enough, like when I moved to Chicago, I was always labeled as the poor kid, the kid, you know, people who, could tell my home life was different probably than a lot of theirs. And when I got to move to Chicago, nobody knew me there. And so I got this clean break to like build a new personality where nobody could put any labels on me. And so as soon as I went to this completely new city, taking care of myself, doing my own clothes, making my own breakfast, putting myself to bed at night, like everything. And um, along with that, like, came like I started getting straight A's in school like I stopped getting in trouble whatsoever like I was um you know being released kind of from the environment that I grew up in and all the peers and stuff I had around me um you know when I was a kid like whenever I got suspended from the school in third grade I have a distinct memory of my mom taking me to the new school district one that I spent like a lot of my time in um, but we moved all the time too. And the principal literally leaned down to me in third grade and he said, you know, we don't want you here, right? Oh, yeah. 
Jeez, man. Right, right, right in front of, right in front of my mother. <laughs> the kid, the kids in my classroom were told that I was a kid that got in a lot of trouble and they needed to be careful around me. I might be stealing or lying or hurt them. So my classmates as kids, like got an impression of me as a kid to avoid, you know, like coming into this new school system. But all of that to say is whenever our, I got into church, I ended up going off to this church camp. I told my mom before I left, I said, I don't know why you're making me go. I don't believe in God. I don't believe such a thing exists. Like, and yeah, I'm pretty much just going to go there and try to <laughs> hook up with girls or try to find, you know, find a, yeah, find yeah. a girlfriend is all I cared about, you know? And so I went and I spent the first three days sitting in the back row with the pastor's son, like sitting in the back of the church camp, like goofing off and, you know, really focusing on girls. But like, I kept watching these services and they were these incredibly powerful, like Pentecostal services, you know, kids speaking in tongues, people like crying and weeping and like processing their emotions and loving each other. And like, we had altars, we had altar calls that lasted like four and a half, six hours. Like there was kids that would go into the night, like, Jeez. like, like, yeah, it was power, emotionally powerful driven circumstances. And so like on the third night, like I was just unhappy. I was, or like the fourth night I was, I was mean, I was unhappy. I had so much like trauma in my life and internalized it all to where I eventually was like, I walked in that night and I was like, okay, I'm going to sit on the front row tonight. I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to actually give this a shot. And so that night was like, and my Christian story was the night that I got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit and called into ministry all at the same time. Wow. Threefold. I I had threefold. Yeah. I spent, I, and so from that night, literally from that night, I came back. My mom started getting into church, got saved, started going to church with my brother, got into church. Like I came back on fire and completely changed, you know, sold out for God. And it was the first positive experience that I've had ever had of like feeling safe in the universe, feeling like since I made this decision, since I wow. believed this certain way, I'm going to be safe. Even if this life sucks, I'm going to get this heaven thing no matter what, you know? And so there was a real sense of like security that I'd never had before that like I now see was like so crucial for like those years that I spent in church. Like, there was a lot of damage that was done. And I don't, I don't even know if it's, if I would even call it that, but there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of negatives to the experience as well that I learned from, but there was definitely the security aspect and this like absoluteness of truth that mm. I'd never been able to stand on in my life. And so like now when I got called into ministry, I'm like at this church camp, I see this guy speaking and there's this, you know, guy up here that's doing this amazing sermon, you know, and he's just like bringing, you know, all of these people to Christ. And it was the most powerful thing that I had ever experienced. And I was like, I want to do that. Like, I'm going to do that. I know no matter what, like, that's what I'm supposed to do. And so from that day, that like Thursday forward, you know, fast forward all the way to when I'm 20 years old, all through high school, like I was completely devoted to God. I was completely devoted to ministry. Like I was, I fully, I like served in the worship bands at church and, you know, led the small groups and the Bible studies. And like, I, there was nobody making me do it. And there was nobody that could have stopped me. Like I was so con victed in like my beliefs like even in high school to where like my fam we got a new pastor at our, like our local church and my family really liked him and i disagreed theologically with the way that he handled his altar calls when i'm like 17. <laughs> so i drove yeah, an yeah. hour so i drove an hour and 45 minutes two times a week every wednesday and sunday to a church an hour and 45 minutes away where i agreed with the the guy because i thought he was preaching the or he was actually following the Bible soundly. Yeah. And so yeah. like my parents are like, yeah. you're not going to a different church. I'm like, this is my spiritual walk. And literally even back then I had, that's one thing that my childhood gave me was a, a very strong sense of autonomy. 
Mm. and a strong sense of my own self and boundaries. And so, you know, like some people have a really hard time with like what their parents are thinking and want them to do and like putting pressure on them. And like, for me, I've just never had time for that bullshit. I'm like, no, like this is, if it's my conviction, I'm going that way. And, you know, so then I, my family all went to church one way and I got in, I drove my car and I paid for my own gas and I went to this other church. And so Um, it, you know, a lot of times whenever people meet me now, they, when they hear like, oh, he used to be a Christian or, and and I, you know, I don't even really label myself any particular way. I don't label myself as like an ex-Christian or anything like that. But whenever I had this, you know, I used to be this, have this very fundamental belief in this, this lens that I needed everybody else to see. And not only that, but I thought it was the absolute truth, the absolute word of God. And so then there was like, the conviction that comes across it's like well i'm not telling you the truth i'm telling you what god said right this isn't this isn't my truth it's right here word for word none of it's wrong none of it's inerrant just this exact one lens that you read it through you know it was just a a a more childlike way of reading the bible is how i see it now and like i see that the level of consciousness that i was at like i was in that like there was no ability to see outside of it there was no ability to you know, see even some of the discrepancies between my own beliefs and like some of the things that I believed and how it actually made me act anti-Christian based off of just some of my Christian justifications, you know, and like, um, yeah, I guess I just got um, a little bit lost on that one. But so that's kind of like a big chunk of the backstory of like what led me. So, you know, I ended up going to all through high school, like, and I went into Bible college. I went to the James River Leadership College here. It's like a big mega church. Um, and they had, a, they start, they partnered with like a, um, a Bible college for the AG. And so I signed up, I joined that. I met my wife um, in my first year of that, not in there. She wasn't even really a Christian. And then we started dating. I got her to start coming to church with me. She joined the year after me. We both went through the same exact Bible program, the same exact oh, like wow. um, thing. So like we just jumped in it together. And my whole plans were to be a youth evangelist and a missionary, basically just and travel around. And so I used to go to rallies in the area and travel around and speak and um, go to youth rallies and, and, you know, lead them and had like powerful altar calls and, you know, it's like I've, <laughs> you know, legitimately probably prayed with over like three or four hundred people. You know, the message of Ooh. salvation. Yeah. And wow. Like, really? Yeah. That's a big deal. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. And so, yeah. All of that to say, when it started unraveling for me, it really felt like I died. It really felt like I was dying, and something so fundamental to like it. It was in every pore of me, you know, like, but what was really in every pore of me was separation. The God was out there and I'm just this little thing down here. Mm. And that egg had to crack open, you know? And so I ended up having like a, you know, I started getting, trying to find a job in the church and I was volunteering all the time at the church, but I was still working on the side. And, you know, we were applying for youth pastor positions and nothing ever seemed to line up. Nothing seemed to work out. It always seemed like everybody wanted my free time, but nobody was ever willing to value me enough to give me a position. And, you know, so I started getting a little bit like practically burned out by the church. Like I was all all in, had been for a long time and just wanted to do that full time, but couldn't, you know, even going through all of the steps like wasn't able to find great jobs in it. And like, now I see that as a blessing. Um, But eventually we just slowly, like my wife was definitely faking it through more church than I was most like she come to find out like years later, like was having a harder time than I was being married to a guy that was completely sold out for it. And in the back, she's feeling like, I'm no, I'm not as sold out as he is. And I've got to kind of fake it along the way, you know, like, wow you know, and be the, the wife of the pastor and be the, and she was willing to take all the, yeah. And she, and she was Ryan's wife. She was an angel or her own person. She was Ryan's wife. 
mm-hmm. you know, hey, is Ryan's wife around here? Is it, you know, it was just that was her, her identity was so to other people was so mixed up in that. And then also she felt just like, especially theologically, like, and I gave off this energy and everything as well, like in the most loving way I knew how, but it was like, I'm the head of this household. I am following God. You were following me, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and to some people, obviously that can sound really extreme. And to me, that sounds extreme now, even though we do have a similar dynamic now to where like, but I, to where she just, you know, she still trusts me and she still lets me lead, but I like, it's nothing I've Im- I impose upon her at this point. It's coming from actual trust and leadership, you know, instead right. of like, instead of a doctrine. Um, and so I slowly started distancing myself from church, started going a little bit less, you know, at the time we were, I got into smoking like hookah and we would go out and drink with the friends a little bit and think, you know, the lines between like what was allowed and what wasn't allowed. I started to give myself a little more freedom and like, well, this actually feels pretty good, you know, and part of me is feeling like I'm just a sinner and not treating yeah. my body like a temple. And other part of me <laughs> is like, well, damn, you know what? This feels pretty good to let myself breathe for a little bit. And so then I started like shedding my expectations of myself a little bit and started just, you know, I went through a phase where I ended up, you know, drinking too much with a buddy and just like, you know, just kind of swinging out of the church phase a little bit. But I also had some friends that were also fundamentalist um, Christians and, you know, they were they also, are. were they also they in still- the assemblies of God? Uh, I don't know exactly where they go. They still have a lot of, we're still friends. We still hang out. They they still have a lot of their still same beliefs, which has been um, very interesting because they, they ended up giving us our first mushrooms and they they were, they, they were the only Christians we knew that were like sold out for God and started like going to music festivals. And they like told us, they're like, have you ever tried mushrooms before? And we're like, no, we've never tried anything like that. And they're like, one of the most beautiful things you could do is trip with your spouse and have a mushroom trip with your spouse in the woods. And we're like, okay, I guess we'll try it. We trust you guys, you know? And so they ended up coming back from a music festival like a couple months later and they had through a friend and we ended up getting like this little pack of mushrooms. And so we go on vacation to Florida and we decide one afternoon to just like make this tea and drink this tea that we had made. Um, And it wasn't like a crazy, crazy psychedelic experience, but it was a very like, you know, and the marker of the timeline in my life, it was a very big moment because it was this reinstilling of like wonder back into the world. Like it felt like I had had dust over my eyes and everything was just kind of bland and I had, everything was normal and every nothing was magical and everything was jaded. And, you know, and then I had this experience where it just literally made everything beautiful again. Like the trees were so beautiful. My wife was so beautiful. Like I was in connection with the moment and I was, you know, having like these internal openness just happening and like, oh, just awe of the universe again to where I didn't have to know anything about it. It was just right there, you know? And so I still say like, I don't see the trees the same way after that one experience. Like I they still feel like they are green and, or I mean, they're green, but they still feel like they pop and are vibrant. And I notice all the different colors of them that just, it wasn't there before. And so that was like, that's almost like a chapter. I feel like that took me up to like where I am now, which we can kind of talk about some more of that if you want, before I go on. Yeah. Well, um, about how long, how long ago was that? 2016 was when that mushroom, that first mushroom experience, July, July 4th, 2016, I think is actually when it was. Um, And so I guess it's been like five years now. So it's been, um, time's been flying and also it's felt like an eternity, you know, and that, that kind of moment that led me into like, a couple months later, I went to my very first music festival 
by myself. Everyone else had to cancel out. I'd never gone to anything like that. I'd only had this one mushroom experience of any really drug experiences or anything outside of um, cannabis. And then I end up going to this mush or to this music festival and having a accidental, basically 10 strip of LSD trip where it is extremely, extremely powerful and going through this crazy ego death that literally felt like I went through hell, died and came back and, and had like PTSD for almost like a year after this experience because it was so intense. And I didn't go there intention. I didn't do that intentionally. Like I was just, I tried these mushrooms, these people that I just met at this music festival, they were like, you know, I had heard of acid, I'd heard of LSD, but I didn't, I didn't, didn't know anything. All that I knew was just like, I was in this seeking mode now. Like I went from like, I, I tasted some finding yeah, and it was yeah. like, okay, wow. Like what else is out there? Like, what have I been cutting myself off of for all of these years? So I was in a place yeah. of, of being willing to explore. And so just through bad information, bad, <laughs> bad all around set setting, all of the things that I know about like therapeutic use of these substances, like it just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't there. Right. It was just a very right, right. naive experience, but it also was something that like catalyst was a very intense catalyst, even though I couldn't even, I couldn't even integrate it for like almost a couple of years. And I'm still integrating that experience. It was so profound, but it put me in this entire different relationship with the universe and with death. And like, whenever I would try to tell people about this experience afterwards, you tell people and they're like, Oh, it, it you felt like you were dying. It like, or you felt like you were going to die or something like that. You know, like you were kind of just freaking out. I was like, no, from my perspective, everything in all of existence ended up completely disappearing and shattering all of my personality, all of my body, all of this world and ended up into just a void of nothing but consciousness. And the whole time I was fighting it. So it felt like I was falling down like an abyss or like a rabbit hole, like clinging onto the side and screaming, no, I don't want to die. Basically, You know, it was like, and it was what I could have, what I would imagine as hell. It was pure resistance but what I found on the other side of the resistance, and it's taken me a long time to get there now, was that everything else disappeared but me. That thing I call me, that thing that I call me was left in this place called, you know, the void. It's just nothingness, almost like you imagine when you're in deep sleep. And it was like falling into a safety net. Like really all the resistance and all the fighting of the mind thinking I'm gonna die I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And then that eventually going away. So it's like it actually dies, the ego, whenever it goes away. But all that basically died was everything that's not you in that experience. And so all of these things feel like they're being ripped away while you're kind of like identified with them. Yeah. And and the experience was, you know, I think people like can get to these places through like just internal connection and meditation and like doing right. their work. And I think these substances are like, you know, it's like a surefire way to get you there, but you still like, it's not a shortcut. Like all of the lessons that you would have to be learning along the way, like all of the reasons why you're really disconnected from yourself, like there's no getting around them in the, and those like level of experiences. And yeah, so that shifted my entire world to a whole other level as I was like on my way out of Christianity, which kind of brought me into, you know, just where I am now, which isn't really yeah. you know, anywhere in particular, but, um, man, I yeah, have feel free to ask, feel free to ask I, away. I know there's a, I'm trying to like hold all the questions in here and not, forget them. <laughs> but I, I, well, let me, yeah, let me go back. Cause I, I am curious. So when you, when you did before you'd had that ego death with the LSD, when you first took that mushroom and you reconnected with nature, um, were, were you still a Christian then? I would have considered myself. Yeah. And like, it's even weird. It's like, 
I say Christians probably wouldn't define me as a Christian, but I don't have any problem with it. You know, like some people that define themselves hard, like as a, a certain view of Christians. And that was also a big part of my way out was like the deconstruction. I didn't just like go out into drugs and have this experience. I went into the deconstruction literature. I started reading the Christian mm. mystics. I started, I started theologically finding my way out. So At, I, simultaneously as you were doing the, the drugs. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to say like where, cause it was like an experience, you know, this experience might be 10 or 12 hours or four hours or whatever it was, but then there's the weeks and weeks of reading and searching internally and contemplating, you know, and then there's the experience and then there's all the time in between. So it's not like, yeah. you know, these, ex these drug experiences that I had were like, there were parts of it, but they literally wouldn't have existed if the whole rest of the journey wasn't already happening. I wouldn't have got to the festival by myself and got to the place of going through that ego death without have of gone in, having gone through Richard Rohr and having mm. gone through the Deconstructionist podcast and having no. gone through, yeah. So having gone, I started with like the Bad Christian podcast and found Christians cussing, right? And then it's like, and then that <laughs> there, that only got so deep, but then I would hear the books that they were talking about. And so then I'd go read that book and then I'd hear who they were being influenced. And then like, I got into the Richard, uh, have you read Richard Rohr? Or I've Cambridge read, Richard Rohr? yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a big fan of Richard Rohr. Um, yeah. I have not read a ton of his works. Um, I read, was it Falling Up a while back mm -hmm. when I was getting yeah, into this? Yeah, I think this. that might have been the first, might have been one of the first ones I read with him. Yeah. And so that was like, because for me, the, the, the beliefs at the core of it were everything. And so like, I was theologically, like I say theologically, but for what, I guess what that means to me is like, theology for me stood for the truth and so like i was any time where like and truth wasn't just like a belief but truth was like was this true to my experience you know so it was like i started feeling all of this the love you know what i would call the love would have called the love of god and i was yeah. feeling and hearing all of these people tell me that this thing is unconditional and that it's omnipresent that it's everywhere that it's it has no beginning and no end and it's completely not tied up with experience. And it's this thing that is like, you know, unconditional. And so as I started and then it's like, okay, well, what about all these conditions everybody's talking about? You right, know, and like, right. and like the condition on my soul from the beginning that like, I don't even have a shot at not being disconnected from God from this point of view. And, I, you know, at that, at that, at that point, at, this was what the Bible said. I didn't know that there was thousands of years of people also with that same kind of integrity and truth, writing and experiencing and speaking and teaching different things and reading that book through a different lens. Right. Yeah. So people say, well, that's not what the Bible says. It's like, well, that's the Bible according to whoever, whatever perspective is and not, you know, putting the analysis on it at that point. And, you know, I had always heard of Jesus's connection to God and I had been called a son of God and I had been told that I was adopted into the family of God and that like all of creation was good from the get-go whenever God first made it but then somehow I should be in agony and turmoil over my existence because just my existence itself was appalling to this God because it was perfect and mm. you know this one being broke this thing way back the very first guy messed it up and you know, it's been downhill <laughs> for the rest of us I know and it's like right. you know for me there was a Theologically, uh, it just started to reach its depth. And so then I found people talking about our inner world and it was so revelatory to me and also confusing that all of right. my Bible teaching, all of my seminary training, all of everything that I knew from this particular interpretation of the Bible, the most they said about your inner world was that even if you think about a woman, you're sinning against her. 
yep. you know, but yep. it, but there was this whole aspect of my being that was completely unaddressed. And then come to find out people were addressing it. People have been addressing it. There's wonderful books on it. There's, oh, yeah. there's people who've been killed for it. You know, there are people who have been killed for having conversations like you and I at certain times in the past that we can have freely now. And there's Christian mystics who were burned at the stake because right. of their blasphemy. And, you know, there, there's Jesus, the exact same thing. The truth that these people started speaking was that there's no separation, you know, that. Is there, was there like a particular Christian mystic that you really enjoyed that felt like influential for you? You know, honestly, the biggest, and I still consider like Richard Rohr, Christian mystic. He was the biggest one for me because he was relevant. He was still alive. And like, he started pointing to like, um, like Thomas Merton. Um, right. So like this whole realm of contemplation, which like got me into like starting to understand like prayer from a different perspective and like started to understand like, um, yeah, going from feeling like I was ha ha connecting to God through a middleman to just going directly to source because realizing there was no no cutout between me and that. Right. You know? Right. And so while I think for, for me, I think that Jesus has a lived a beautiful example on earth of what it's like to refuse to acknowledge the separation of the people around you and to re refuse to identify with yourself as something separate. So like Jesus, he identified with himself with the father. Yeah. Like yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't, he didn't see Jesus in the father. He didn't see two beings. And when he looked around and saw, and this is my perspective, when he looked around and he always talked about the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's like the most popular thing he said in the whole Bible. So it was like, well, what is, so Jesus is walking around and there's people crucified on crosses. There's children that are starving. There's people that are hurting. And somehow he sees the kingdom of heaven and other people see hell all around them. So it's like, and I had that experience myself when I had like what I call my, like what for me felt like a moment in time of like what I call like my first real spiritual awakening. It was like the ego going away without me fighting. It was me basically feeling like I gave it away or just let it go. Like it was nothing. And in wow. that moment, like literally it felt like I was in heaven and it felt like I was in heaven because there was nothing that was disconnected. There were no names or forms to like separate things is literally a unitive experience to where it was the most, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. And like, I realized in that, you know, in those moments, you realize like, it's this moment, it's all moments. Like if that is a re if that's like the level of reality where, you know, we call this my hand and I say, I have a thumb and I've got four fingers, but really it's just this hand, you know, there's really not a thumb and four fingers. It's just this. And you can say, I have a hand, but it's really just a part of your arm. And you can say, Oh, well, that's really not a different part than your arm. It's all part of the arm. And like you can do that to the whole body and you can do that to the whole planet. You can do that to the whole universe until there are no missing pieces left. Right. And that's mm. to me, that's God. God is the universe without any missing pieces. It's completely whole and there are no lines that cut through it. You know, if you look on a map, we have states, but if you go and look, those lines don't exist. You just have land, open land that connects to each other. And we divide it up and we call it states. Those just don't exist. You know, I call you Justin, you call me Ryan, but like really it's whatever this is here communicating to itself before we put the names on top of it, you know? Mm. What do you think was the first uh, theological pin to go for you? The penal substitutionary atonement theory. Wow. That's the first one. Well, okay, interesting. 
that's the one that needed to go. I don't know if it was the first pin that went, but that's the one I cared about. Yeah. That's the one I cared about. God doesn't love me. I cared, mm -hmm. I cared deeply about that one. Yeah. And it wasn't my experience. My experience was even, you know, and a lot of people like I was talking to a gentleman the other day and I was, I said something to the effect of we're already home and he was not in a very like great place mentally. And he kind of like repulsed to it. He's like, how can you say that? I can say we're already home, you know, like I don't feel at home. I don't. And I was like, I'm not saying that like tongue in cheek out of some naivety. I'm saying it as somebody who's been through hell and realized we we're always at home. You know, I went, I've gone like, I was blessed enough to have the childhood that I had. I was blessed enough to be forced into enough suffering to where I wanted it to stop. And so that wanting it to stop, I think is just nothing but that feeling that we all have of like suffering, of searching, of looking for something is literally just our feeling of wholeness calling us home. You know, it's just like a safety mechanism. It's like, oh, if you hurt, just move the other way, you know? And so I'd gone through a lot of hurt. I'd gone through completely feeling lost in this world, completely feeling like an orphan in this world, completely feeling cut off, feeling like a father didn't care about me, feeling like the divine father was, you know, existentially disgusted by me is, but not if I, not through Christ, you know, the Christ thing really redeemed some of that factor, but there was still these underlying things of like, I don't believe, I don't believe that I'm not the father's son, you know, like, and that's what I think Jesus died for was telling everybody around them, like, and that's not how people view it. And that's not how, like, you know, he would say things like to him who has ears, let him hear. And that means he was speaking to a whole room full of people and he's spoken parables and he's spoken stories and he had to be very careful. He couldn't even be as blatant as I am. And that's one of the things that I love most about Christ is literally I can speak my truth because of him, because there are people that are Christians. Wow. Right. And I think that people killed him for the same truth. That is my truth. And I think that the adoption of him into our society and the, ethos of like what we have as americans which is like in in the west like this the right of the sovereign citizen like this idea of um freedom of speech and freedom of expression of your religion and like that every soul and every person is valuable it's not solely to christ like buddha was saying things like that you know 500 years before christ was even around but that was that was something that has made it into our ethic as a Christian culture, or even as like as a Western culture, that is part of the reason, you know, it's the same people you're, you might be afraid of to speak this truth to that are also the same people that like the right to speak the truth to was born through. Interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. I mean, I've not really conveyed it that way. I just kind of connected the dots now, but yeah, like, you know, yeah, being able to, uh, I think that's a, I think that's a big part of like, what I'm grateful is like, so to me now, Christ dying for me has a different, I, I can look at it a different way. Like, to me, Christ didn't die for me, because I'm not worthy. And he had to um, uphold this, this uh, contract of sin between us and God. Like now, like for me, like when I look at Christ, I see an inspiration of somebody who, from my experience of having this experience of what I call Christ consciousness, which, you know, Richard Rohr has a new book called The Universal Christ, and he's basically talking mm. about this. But Christ consciousness, what is it like to see from Christ's eyes? And from Christ's eyes, all he sees is God. Mm. It's all he wow. sees. Yeah. So from that consciousness, from that level of consciousness, there just are no separated parts. And 
and everything is the face of the beloved. And then, you know, but we are all like, I've been studying a guy named Ken Wilber and like studying, learning his work and like learning over the last hundred years, like what we've learned from um, like developmental psychology, like Freud and them on, we have, we have understanding of the develop of the psyche, which is a lot of like the realm that you work in from like, from what I understand. And I started under like, there's a thing called spiral dynamics. I don't know if you've ever yeah, heard it. I've heard it's of basically, it. Yeah, it's basically the evolution of our consciousness. And we've only been able to track this data for like a hundred years. So like literally none of our major traditions of religion, Hinduism, all the ones, like all the Vedic scriptures, all, all none of these stuff really have an understanding of this level of psychological development. So Ken Wilber has what they call waking up, he calls in one category and growing up in another category. So you can think of Interesting. These, these, these as like two wall, two ladders that go against a wall, like the same wall. And the growing up is what he calls the psychological development. And you can see this now in what they call spiral dynamics. And basically every individual person goes through this and we as a collective are going through it. And so you might have individuals that spiral up ahead of the median of the collective, but the collective is all rising together slower. And you're, they're actually tracking like these different levels and they have names for them. And it basically goes from being what they call archaic, which is like, you can imagine an animal being born or a baby being born. And they haven't developed a sense of self necessarily and they haven't developed this sense of like differentiating between them and the world. So like I had a, whenever our child was born, whenever he first came out of the womb, he has no sense of himself and the mother, him and the mother are just the same thing. And right. they, even, they, they would have a stage for this, that they call it like child development. And basically in that level of consciousness, there's no separation between you and the outside world, but it's almost like a complete merging. You know, there's no individuated sense of self that can move through it. Then the next level is what they call, um, it goes from archaic to magic. Okay. And so you can see this individually, you can see a child, they start to develop a sense of self and then they believe in mat. They believe in magic. And so what the magic level of consciousness from its perspective, something happens on its inside world and it relates to, and then something on the outside world happens. So you're a little kid and you th you go, oh, I just hate my dad. And then he slips on the sidewalk outside and falls and you go, oh my God, I made my dad fall. Like you think that your mm -hmm. actions, yeah. your internal world is directing the outside world. Okay. And so this is kind of the level of consciousness that most of, that are a lot of our major religions started to spawn out of culturally at one level, this at one part in time, this was the leading level of consciousness. Okay. And so after it moves from there, it goes into what they call mythic literal. So this level of consciousness takes the mythic literally. Okay. Ah, sounds like so religion. this, this, yes, this is where basically all of our fundamental religions, as we know them and have known them, have been birthed out of. So the level of consciousness that birthed these was that it was the highest level at that point. And so all of these are important steps that none of them can be pulled out from underneath. But what they're showing now is like people ask this question, why are people in the world this way? Why are there people that are, why do people act like that? You know, and we're starting to understand that literally this level of consciousness it starts getting a sense of self and then it becomes very egoic and it's, it's all about protection of self. And as it keeps growing and expanding, as it moves through the levels, it goes from magic mythic, which they also call the power gods. So now it goes from magic inside of me doing things out there to now there's a God outside of there doing things in here. So the power shifts and now Zeus, Yahweh, all these things are actual gods power that they are more powerful than me. They are outside of here. And it's kind of like a God and pawn type situation. That's like that level of consciousness. Then it goes to like rational is one of the other ones. So then you start getting into like, do you see it culturally in the scientific enlightenment? So you see that they came through the religions and then the next level of conscious that emerged out of that was rationality. Yep. And so that started going and then out of rationality, basically, to make all of the universe a short story, 
our leading level right now is what they categorize as integral. It's not the lead, it's the leading level that like one or 2% of our population, you're probably will be could still be considered an integral thinker just doing the work that you're doing. The integral thinker, all the steps before it, the thing that makes them what they call a, a first tier stage is every step thinks that it steps the right way. So every level, it basically can only see from its perspective. And then as you move into what they call tier two, which is integral, you start getting a level of consciousness that can see others perspective and seeing how everything is moving as a whole. That's really interesting. Yeah. And so yeah. I think that's been my story. I think that, that I, and I know that like, as I was going through that religion, and as I was in that fundamental st fundamentalist state of consciousness, that's what I needed at the time. That was like, there was things developing in me. And, but as it moved that container, I had to, you know, and what I ended up doing was like rejecting it and trying to move past. And what we really have to do is like Ken Wilber also teaches in there, like basically it's a, a law of the universe is transcend and include is the model of evolution. Mm. Yeah. And so as we move past something, the universe, as it always does that, it always incorporates the levels below it into its next fullest level. It doesn't actually reject anything, you know, because it's an indivisible whole. And so that's what's happening with us is we're also having this consciousness that can go through you or I, and we can we can kind of go up independent of perhaps where some people in our culture are. But then as the culture, it's all like moving slower. And so it's kind of bad news to people that think that they can speed it up or can control it or whatever. But it's also really interesting to see like the basically the front end of where our religion and our spirituality is right now and trying to understand how it all works together. There's a level of consciousness that is capable of not having wars anymore. You know, it's capable of letting other people believe what they need to believe it's capable of being offended without needing to strike back you know it's a it's a it's christ you know it's more right. towards a christ consciousness yeah and you know i'm not one of those people that thinks like the whole world is just gonna like pop and like wake up soon like all at the same time and there's this giant but i do i do feel like and even some of these are like internal images that i get that there is this steady thing that's happening and I trust the universe. It's brought all of this in so far. Yeah. It's brought everything that we have here and it's put everything without any agenda, everything works seamlessly together. And so I'm not scared of where it's going. And along with being like one of the things that I think is ingrained in our culture is you, we've got the good, but we've also got the bad. And one of the main things that I think in like all of these conspiracies and a big part of like how we're treating the world is how the book of revelation ingrained in us as a species. Yeah, that is a whole another conversation. That's, whole, that's, that's, that's yeah. really interesting, you know, because yeah. well, for one, you know, revelation was a very as a disputed book in the canon. And we have no idea who wrote it, really. And and oh, right. and secondly, there's so many different interpretations, even throughout history, you know, mm. of of how Revelation should be interpreted. But yeah, that's that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I want to respect your time. Uh, how are you on time? I know I said 45 um, minutes, but we went over. Yeah, I'm I'm fine on time. We can. I'm enjoying the conversation. So whenever you feel like wrapping it up, okay. we can wrap it up. Um, but yeah, you know, that was a that was a big thing for me was thinking that like. The world's going to hell. I so I used to I used I used to I used to throw bags of trash out my window of my car, whole bags of trash from the food place, just as a Christian. Really, you took it that I, far? That's so interesting. I mean, it's bad, but that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. But at that at that place, like all I could see, like my deeply held belief was that we have dominion over this earth there's all these demons and this Satan thing running around here anyways, trying to fuck it up. And we're really all just trying to get past this thing to heaven. So who cares what it looks like? Yeah. Okay. You know? And it wow. was like, it was the, the earth bypassing was so strong, you know, like I think so many people in that state of consciousness, there's a lot of fear. And so, we just want out of this place. We just want off of it. And it goes into like, you know, I've transitioned into like 
working with conscious spiritual coaches and stuff, but there's, there's basically the whole new age side of things, which I try to avoid as well, which a bunch of people would probably call me new age, but what I'm really avoiding on like either side of like, it's not the beliefs, it's the level of consciousness where it's like fundamentalism and extremism and it, it can't see the greater holes. And so you'll have that across cults. You'll have that across religions. You'll have that in atheists. You'll have that in moms and dads. And, you know, there's anybody that's kind of in that space where they're literally haven't expanded into their fuller capacity to see yet. You know, that's also where I think like knowing that. And I think Jesus understood that, like to me, like the powerful words on the cross, like forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And I take that as he saw that he was speaking the truth to them, that he was looking them right in the eyes and saying, I'm it. Like, this all is it. This is what you're looking for all around you. And it didn't matter. It was like he was not speaking to them. And all they heard was what they could hear. And they killed him for it. And, you know, there's something to be said. You know, I I don't any longer have the chains of needing to interpret the Bible through the canon. I no longer have the chains of trying to justify any particular scripture. I don't have the chains of any particular dogmatic belief around the scripture. Like I don't have any, I don't get any of my valid, like my validation of what I can pull from that scripture from the scripture. I get it from inside. And so it's like, does that resonate with inside? Not, is this true? Should I stuff it away and make it inside? But it's like, yeah, that is, you know, I can find, I can now, and I can now go through the Bible and I still have all kinds of, you know, cause there's a lot of scriptures really deep ingrained in me and they just have a whole different light now to them. They have a whole, yeah. and I, I would, if I tried preaching my, five year ago self a sermon or even tried having me listen to this conversation. Yeah. It would have been almost impossible. Right. Like the yeah. screen would be broken. All the words would not want to be listened to. Like, and so then it's like, now I'm, you know, I'm trying to look at other people like that. Like, and I'm trying to, whenever I had not integrated my Christianity yet, that other couple that I love very dearly, all I wanted to do was convert them to my new way of thinking, you know, and I even tried and saw myself basically as the devil in, in their eyes because I was coming with this anti, I was coming with this blaspheming according to them message and according to right. my old self. Yeah. And so there was like this, there was still like some, and probably why I haven't even done a lot of talks like these around it is there was a lot, it took me a while to not need to swing away from it and reject it either. So now it's like, I'm okay with people at that level. I'm okay. I understand where they're at. I don't need to change them. And I can still simultaneously like hold where I'm at and see that I'm really glad that I made it through that. And I'm really yeah. glad that I ended up here and that, you know, and so now it's just like, I'm just trying to hold this space for people and when they're ready, when they have ears to hear it, when they're in a place where they want to hear it, then I'd be glad to tell people my perspective. But I think ultimately, like, you know, that's business, so to speak, between them and God. Like, we right. all we all are going to, whether it's death on this side of death or on this other side of death, I believe, this separation, I, mean, I think that's what death is. I think it's a kind... It's probably our dearest friend and it's bringing us back home over and over and over again. And we we have this story that death is this awful thing. And we've got ourselves in this coronavirus situation. All mm -hmm. the whole world is the way that it is right now. So we don't have death. So, so we can avoid it. So we can put it off as long as possible. They use it to like manipulate people, you know, losing our voices through the fear of death. And you know, it's like, well, I've only done that on these substances, but what some of these experiences on the substance gave me was no longer a fear of death. 
It was like, I'm not scared of that. And I'm not scared to go there. There's nothing, there's nothing that I love my family and I love being here. And like, I've even had a psychedelic experience where it felt like, and this was just from the perspective of the experience, but it felt like almost like it was going through an ego death and it felt like you could leave right now if you wanted to. And I had, and I had such a strong love for my life and for the world that for, for the first time in that experience, this was, you know, could probably have a whole story of its own, but the, it was the first time where I no longer wanted to spiritually grow to get out of life. You know, like so many people are trying to ascend, you know, especially in the space, like ascend, get to a higher vibe. We're going to another plane, shift into a new dimension. And the highest vibe that I had ever experienced was wanting to be right here in this dimension. Wow. Yeah. That's some powerful truth right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, I, I, and I feel the same way. I felt like for me, and this is still a, um, a struggle, right? That spirituality was this means to escape the Mm -hmm. suffering and the pain and, and not really truly being in my body. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, And I'm sure, I'm sure you experienced this within Christendom you know, all the studying and trying to exegete the text and reading the theologians and philosophers. And, you know, you got to get the right theology. And it's all very like just head, no, no mm. being here now in the body. It's, and it feels like it's, you know, it's like trying to escape. So yeah, I see that not only, and that's not just like bash Christians, <laughs> but I also see that like just every, you know, in other spiritual circles as well. Like, like what you mentioned. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going with that. I'll just yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I think I think yeah. yeah, I think you're right on it. Like, you know, I call like the 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 self help or like the spiritual space. Like, I call it the search for happiness niche. And for my experience, people are either happy, and you could define that however you want, but like peace, joy, like not at war within their own being. Like, you're either that, or you're looking for that. And you're either, you know, and so like, for instance, like when I had a war within my own being and I was looking to the text and the Bible and God and the church and all of these truths to feel that, you know, in church, they say you got a God shaped hole inside of you and, you know, you're just looking for God. And yep. I was really, I was looking for God and not a single person or a single text could show it to me. Yeah. And so it was like, because it was all, it's yeah. been in front of me since the day I was born. It's been in front of all of us since the day we were born. And we're walking around looking at it all the time. And yeah. the staring in the scripture and looking for God, it's like, it's the paper, it's the ink, it's your finger, it's your eyes, like reading the very paper, reading the very words that you're looking for, you know? Mm. I'm cu- I'm curious. Um, would you can like try to nail down your theological position here, which I'm sure for people who have deconstructed, usually that's kind of difficult. But mm. would you consider yourself like a pantheist? Like it's all the mm. universe is God. It's all. It's so, all in pantheism, from my understanding of it, is that there are. All of these objects, all of these, there's a cup and it's got God in it. So microphone, it's got God in it. The trees, they've got God in them. I've got God in me. Or there's a Ryan and Ryan is God. Tree is God. Lamp is God. My wife is God. My child is God. Guitar is God. And in my perspective, there is no lamp. There is no tree. There is no microphone. Mm. There is no Ryan. There is no Justin. There's only God. And God is not something that can have an image and it has no border to it. So, you know, in the Bible, like there's this idea of like, you can make no graven image of God. If any image you cast of God is an idol. And that's because God has no shape. God has no sound. God is what it is all made of and arising in. So it's not like Mm -hmm. 
there, there are no individual objects. There are no individual people. There's only the father. Hmm. It's interesting. Have you, um, I'm curious, have you ever heard of uh, Neville Goddard? I've heard of him, but I don't know his work deeply. He would resonate with what you're saying. Mm. In his teachings, he, he goes into the esoteric meaning of the Bible. Mm. Um, he learned from a, a, a Kabbalist, apparently. But uh, yeah, he would be saying the same thing. Like, yeah, it's all God. Yeah. So my experience of that and like to take that deeper is like take it to the word of consciousness. So there's a belief in that uh, the basic our fundamental worldview of society, like the basic scientific paradigm, even 13.8 billion years ago, Big Bang. Through time, all of this evolution evolution from the most basic matter starts turning into more complex. You start to get more complex organisms, single cell organisms, like like the DNA and the oh, atom. No, my arm here. Let's go. Um, and, and basically out of this emerges this thing called consciousness, right? So that they, they, they haven't found it in the brain yet, but the scientific paradigm is that out of, out of matter, Complexity, 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 complexity. We start getting conscious organisms, but a rock isn't conscious. And, and they've started moving that line back more and more and more, the more they like understand quantum physics. But basically like my paradigm, and this just comes from exploring direct experience. And one of my favorite teachers to, to lead people to this point is, his name's Rupert Spira. But it's direct taking us and taking us directly to the I am. So the very essence of your isness. And when we explore this isness, which is what people, you know, meditation is, should be actual meditation is merging and being this isness, which is literally just being as you are basically consciously. But if you explore your consciousness, deep enough, you will realize that the entire world and all of existence is fundamentally reliant on it. It's the one thing that you can't imagine disappearing from your experience. And, right. and without it, experience doesn't exist whatsoever. And so there's this idea that there's this world sitting here and it exists, so there's this third place world and we're all these little beams of consciousness that are beamed down onto this planet. We live in these bodies and then they die, but the world still exists here, whether or not like our consciousness is present on it whatsoever. From my perspective, this world, from all perspectives, is taking place inside of consciousness as the ground of all being. It's what is fundamental for reality. No consciousness, no reality. Yeah. Does a tree fall in the woods if nobody's around to hear it? No, if there's nobody, no, if there's no consciousness around, if there's no tree around, there's the consciousness is really. And so basically a way of thinking that is like in bigger terms or Christian terms is the mind of God. Mind with a big M is what I would also refer to as consciousness or like God's imagination. And so what I would say in, in like God terms or like religious language is that God is experiencing itself through every perspective and that it's looking out on itself and everything that it looks out on is made of itself, occurring in itself, being recognized by itself, through itself, to itself. And every perspective, and it's, there literally is no separate objects. And so it literally is, god as reality mm. you know and we've and and we've put this separate we have this thing that we call like a sense of self which it's not like it's just a belief system like we get part of our consciousness evolution like just because i have had these experiences does not mean that my child is not going to grow up and disconnect from god disconnect from himself disconnect from the world and have to find it himself just because his parents know it you know, and so this is a, this is a felt lived 
experience of dis- of God discovering itself. And so as I start, when I, when I dropped, I had a friend there that that's first real awakening. And whenever I dropped into that experience in place, all of these questions that I had just felt like they were just answered, 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 like the things that disconnects the things that didn't make sense because it wasn't, it wasn't something I was learning with my head. It was literally fully embodied experience of yeah. truth. It was an embodied experience that there were, that, that everything was the same thing and everything still has its individuality too. So that's why like some people, even in like what we call non-duality circles, they get lost in this, like, there is no self, there is no self, there's only God, it's all one. And it's the one as the many, you know, it's the Christians don't have the problem with this paradox in the Trinity. Right. Right. But take the Trinity and expand it to the entire universe. Right. Yep. Or the, uh, the deity and humanity of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. God God is fully. uh, Yeah. And so if you would ask me my theology, like from a theology perspective, I would tell you what Christ said is that the father and I am one that I think the greatest commandment is to love your neighbor and to love your neighbor as yourself and to love God. And I think that's the same commandment. I don't think Jesus gave two commandments. I think that's one. I think loving God and loving your neighbor and loving yourself is all the exact same thing. And it's God loving God, loving God. It's crazy, man. Yeah. It's weird. It's like um, some of the things you say, like, I'm just like, boom, I'm like resonating. And, and from, you know, talking about this higher perspective, the perspective of love, it makes sense from my, from my human perspective. It doesn't, hmm. I sound, I feel like I sound like an evangelical. Damn it. <laughs> but, no, it's just, the, it's just yeah. the mind. It's just the mind. So our mind deals in duality. It's a duality machine, white, black, yes, yeah. no, up, down, good, bad. Right. And so what I'm talking about is uh, not the merging of two things, not one thing, but something that is not two things. So it's like, there's a billion of, there's a billion people, there's 8 billion people on the planet and there is really only one being on the planet. So it's this, this paradox that you cannot, that your brain literally comes to and it goes, that does not compute. Right. How can two things be one thing? And it's even, they call it non-duality. So it's not, they don't call it like some people, you know, oneness. It's just one. It's just one. Everything is one. Well, that's not true. That's not, te- it's not one. You really couldn't say what it is because that's drawing any image around it. And it's really infinite. It's God. It's undescribable. But if you want to describe it, you can try, you know, it's always going to come. Su- it's always going to come some short. Everything you say about God is the truth but there's always more truth to be had about it. So everything that you could say about God is true and not true at the same time. So you could say non-duality, all of this is not two, which does not negate the billion little beings all experiencing from their perspective. They all are there. You still have your perspective clearly. I still have my perspective clearly, but the main illusion is that those are really two different perspectives, right? Even though those two perspectives exist, we divide it up and say, well, that's his and that's mine. Right. Or we say, well, that's God. And that's, you know, and and we just divide it up. Like we, you know, a tree, the leaves drop on the ground and it's like, you know, are those part of the tree still? Like, are those still like they turned into the mulch or that acorn drops on the ground and then it has all of the tree literally stored inside of it. Like, yeah, I don't <laughs> Gets complicated, man. I'm, uh, yeah, I don't, the, the way that I've conceptualized. So it, tell, yeah. So tell me, yeah. Tell me about yeah. like, we don't have to go super much longer on this, but I'm sure. I'm sure, okay sure. With it. Yeah. <laughs> tell me about how you see the world. Yeah. Well, 
let me preface it by saying I don't know for sure. I just mm. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't put like a like a I'm a hundred percent sure, ninety nine percent sure. I'm I, I don't know, and it depends mm. on the day. You know, I might be more sp mm. skeptical one day versus not. But but um, the spiritual part of me conceptualizes it as that we're all like cells in the body of God. Mm. So, I mean, it's not a perfect analogy, but, you know, all the cell is, is God, but like, I am not necessarily the totality of God, but <laughs> to use Christian, Christian language here, you know, I am truly God. I am still God, but, you know, but, but not, <laughs> not the fullness in one sense. That's how yeah. I understand it as through this analogy. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, and that's completely fine, too. Uh, and in, in a sense, that's completely true. And, you know, if you think about your own body that's inside of you, you have all of these different cells and you have, you know, all these different bacteria and there's like, there's wars going inside of you pretty much on all times at a certain level. And there's blood cells that are fighting out other blood cells and there's a immune system that's constantly battling and taking things in as it's going with the environment. And so like at one level of your being, it would look like discord. And at a different level of your being, it's harmony. Mm. And also you could look inside of your body and you could say, this is just a cell. This is not my body, but all of your body is within that cell because the, that right. it's not, it's not just that one cell, that cell exists within a whole. So even to look at your, like, and I understand what you're saying. Like, I don't like right now, I can't, I can't hear the thoughts inside of your head. Okay. So what's inside of your internal space and what's inside and try inside of my internal space is private. So, it, so it's seen. And so that, like, that's part of our evidence to go like, well, I might be connected to the totality, but I'm not the totality. Look at my limitations. But we're a lot of times identified with the objects of our awareness. So we're identified with the thoughts inside of our head, right. but the, the thoughts inside of our head are being experienced by that awareness, right? Like it's unconditional. It's not thinking. It's, a, it's aware of the thoughts. It's aware of the emotions. It's aware of all of, all of the, the surface noise that's happening, all the thoughts that are going on in your bread, all your particular trauma, your personality, like that structure, that consciousness is aware of all of those, right? And so people, a lot of times we take that, that surface separation, that identity, which changes all of the time, our body, which changes all of the time, and all of these things that are constantly shifting and as long as it's a relatively cohesive picture, we'll say, well, you know, that's me. And throughout, you know, going back to like the, the unconditioned thing, like whenever I say God is consciousness, and then also I take like the description of God, like from the Bible, that's like um, basically indescribable, no boundaries, no borders outside of time and space unconditioned well in all of experience your direct experience there's only one thing that meets that criteria it's your consciousness it has no conditions and if you try to look for it with the mind it'll just come up blank and people spend a lot of time like buddhist monks a lot of time looking for the self and really they're just watching the mind within the self sitting there and hmm. it's this open space that's watching the mind run around it's watching the personality change and it's prior to words it's the it's the ground of all being so it's wordless spaceless it's life itself so that thing that we refer to as i i am you know in the bible that's a big thing like who should i tell him sent you i am i was always taught it says i am what i am the preacher would say, oh, he's just, he's saying that like, I am the one God, I am, you know, just, and after literally the, like within moments, I, I had my first spiritual awakening when a friend 
popped like a bubble. But what I understood in there was like, uh oh, I guess I just lost. I just <laughs> I, I lost that right off of that. Uh, what was I talking? What, what did I say right before the you, you the pair you said your we friend popped about? like a bubble. Yeah, it was just right before that. I got sidetracked with the friend pop the bubble, which. Um, well, we're talking about the I am and and how it used to be, you know, yeah. the preachers would say, I am this, the one God. But but I was assuming that you have a different understanding yeah. now. Yeah. And so it's still that same understanding for me. But what that I am this is what we what our scientific language calls consciousness. And it's what we refer to when we say I. You know, it's the most natural thing in the world for us. But, you know, if I ask you to place your attention on your microphone, you can place your attention on your microphone. Okay. I ask you to place your attention on your hands. You place your attention on your hands just effortlessly. we got this directing attention. And then if you close your eyes and I ask you to direct your attention and I just say, are you aware? Yeah. Okay, so where do you go? Where does your awareness go to find the answer, I am aware? You go over here to the microphone, you go over here to your hands. Where do you, you refer to whenever you say yes? Where does that yes come from? I don't know. Yeah, it's it's because it's the <laughs> it's it's looking for your eyeballs with your eyeballs. Okay, it's going. Where are my eyes? I can't find them anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's because yeah. our awareness is the looker. It's the observer, and it's completely unconditioned. We think it's conditioned, but we attribute the qualities that are being observed in our awareness to the awareness. So I am depressed right now really your awareness is aware of the thought i am depressed and it's aware of these low emotions but it's actually unconditioned by them and this is like this is the really the essence of non-duality is to see that we are this awareness and then the next step is to understand the nature of this awareness and this is where you know, this is where those psychedelics took me was that nature of that awareness that I didn't know I was diving into. I didn't have any of these books or these understandings or it was like, but guess what? In all of that crazy shit, all the fighting, all of the things that were happening in my body, the only thing that was left over, awareness. Awareness with no mm -hmm. objects, just like deep sleep. And it's the only thing I've never experienced disappearing. And people go, well, what about whenever you're in deep sleep? You're not aware then. Well, you're not aware of anything in deep sleep. So awareness, our deep sleep is a state that we go into where all of the objects drop away. It's a very mystical state that we go into every single night. And there are, your body drops away, your awareness of time and space drops away, your awareness of all your problems and your memories. This is after dreaming, right? We go into dreaming and then to deep dreamless sleep. And so in this deep dreamless sleep, from my understanding, that's basically awakening. That's basically the essence huh. of, of what we are is this undefined open space of awareness. It's literally life itself. And so the fear of death, the fear of all the things that we fear, from my experience, that's why I'm not afraid of death anymore is because I went through this psychologically and ended up in this place there where there was nothing but peace. But I, it was like consciously like going through hell and then popping into deep sleep in your dream, but you're just like aware of it. And it felt like falling on a net. It felt like realizing that no matter how much I fought or how far out this life got, that like how I referred to death as a friend earlier, that like it's always going to bring me home no matter what. In this place, just like the Bible describes heaven, there are no tears. There are no anguish there's no separation from god there's no hurt in the body you know it's what people in enlightenment might refer to as like nirvana which is like a conscious state of like 
lack of sensation whatsoever, but it's very similar to deep sleep, but you're like consciously there. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I hope, <laughs> I know this is, yeah, we're good. Yeah. It's I hope really this great. Has been, yeah. I hope you've been, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. I've, uh, for sure. For sure. Uh, you know, I there's, you know there's, a, there's a thousand stories in all of those stories probably, but I know, right. The one of the many. Um, I have one last question. What, what would you say to Assemblies of God Ryan today? Hmm. Probably just that I love you. Really, I don't, I don't think that he could hear anything but that until life takes him through everything it's about to take him through. And so that's the main thing that I try to convey to people now. And that's the understanding that I've come out with. So we really are loved that there's nothing here, but us, all of us together, we're all in this alone together and that the universe is conspiring for our good and we're always safe and that it's okay to be lost. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to go through all the shit that you're probably gonna go through, you know, because we don't have to fight with reality, you know, like what already exists is, uh, there's nothing else that we have, could have, or really do need. And so I don't know what that's going to turn into. I don't know if this whole planet's going to blow each other up in some like lower consciousness, planetary civil war, or if people are going to start seeing that they are love itself and that Christ's message is going to keep going throughout and embodying people and that there's not going to be one Christ that the Christ Christ in all of us is waking up to itself and it's just seeing more Christ everywhere it looks. You know, if you're, uh, if you're a real, if you're really connected to Christ as Christian, then you can see Christ face in every person that you look at. And, and I still, you know, it's not like that for me all the time. I still get fucking angry. I still get pissed. I still get caught up in stuff, but there's a deep part of me. Um, yeah, that knows that you and I are not separate, that knows that what's good for you is directly good for me, that what's harms you is directly harmful for me, that anything I would do to you is immediately being done to myself. Wow. And what you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. Exactly. Well, Ryan, thank you so much. This was a very unexpected conversation and it was super fun and very interesting so thank you so much man yeah thanks for having me brother i will talk to you soon see you soon all right guys thank you guys and we'll see ya thanks